Uh, my name is Carol Ellick. I have a small consulting business called Archaeological and Cultural Education Consultants. I am also an adjunct instructor at the University of Maryland in College Park. And today I'm going to do a presentation called Communicating Stories Through Objects and Actions. We're archaeologists. We deal with objects and their context. We study people through the material that they leave behind, and it is from those materials that we attempt to create the stories of people, their lives, their places. However, this cannot be accomplished except in the most general terms, because we are only looking at the objects, and while these objects are in context, there is so much more that is missing. What do you see when you look at a pile of rocks? Is it simply a pile of rocks, or was it once more? It's often the more that is missing, rotted away through time. But it is what's rotted away that sometimes gives the clue as to what the materials were and how they were used. As archaeologists, we are trained to see those connections, but in achieving our specializations, we often lack the training that might assist us in gaining a fuller story about the place and the thing, and to explain what we've come to understand to others. And a thing is just a thing without its story. Archaeology can be more than an academic exercise. The information obtained through archaeological investigations can be used to assist living peoples Research questions can be and should be developed in cooperation with descendant communities to provide information that would be of cultural and scientific use. Archaeology can be used to tie the past to the present and to assist, assist current indigenous peoples in strengthening identity by providing scientific links, evidence of place and tradition that may otherwise have been lost. On the flip side, it's that traditional knowledge that can assist archaeologists in building a broader understanding of the past by incorporating other ways of knowing. Taken one step further, educational techniques coupled with experimental archaeology and traditional stories can strengthen knowledge of the people within both the indigenous and non-indigenous communities. In this presentation, I discuss how archaeology and education have been and can be used together to create um, information and communication that will strengthen the relationships between public outreach and archaeological education. The field of archaeological education emerged in the U.S. during the 1980s as a mechanism for reducing vandalism to archaeological sites through education. The thought was that by teaching about the importance of context, people would be less tempted to collect artifacts for personal use or for personal collections or for sales on the black market. Additionally, since the U.S. is a multicultural, it was felt that by increasing the awareness of other cultures besides one's own, it would increase sensitivity, tolerance, and appreciation. In 1990, the Society for American Archaeology approved the establishment of the Public Education Committee. The Society for Historical Archaeology followed shortly thereafter, and it was during the late 1980s and 90s uh, that the federal agencies began developing programs that were aimed at reducing vandalism through education. My first experience with public education began with a program with a school district in which I created materials for teachers and children that was based on a mock archaeological site and a laboratory experience where children went through the entire process from asking research questions to writing final reports, and this was applicable in grades three through nine. The most important thing that I learned during that experience was that even though I knew archaeology, I knew how to interpret what I saw in front of me, I actually had no idea how to teach or transfer that knowledge 
on an adequate basis to someone else. So I felt I needed a degree in both education and archaeology. To be effective communicators with peers, stakeholders, and the general public, we must understand learning styles as well as communication styles. If we are to work with teachers and children and educational materials, it's also important to understand learning theory, such as the structures of cognitive process developed by Benjamin Bloom. These, together with anthropological methodologies, benefit anthropologists not only in the setting where they may do public outreach, but in personal management as well, personnel management. According to the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development, most education research indicates that learning styles are a result of both nature and nurture, and that within any group, you will have people with preferences for auditory, visual, text-based, or graphic, and also tactile learning styles. For this reason, it is important when presenting information that it is in such a way that everybody can absorb the context at the higher level. Take this session, for example. In it, we have high levels of linguistic and cultural diversity. To address this, we use traditional professional methods of communication, including oral and visual presentations. To address the tactile learner, we might have included handouts, outlines, printouts of some sort that people could have read and written upon um, that would provide that participatory activity. To lecture to any group and not include visual and hands-on activity loses a certain percentage of the audience. I believe that in some ways that is why archaeology is so popular. It is very visual and very tactile. Let's say I invite you to the pot still for a wee dram later today. By a show of hands, how many of you would prefer a map with a route written on it? Just a drawing, a map, hmm? okay? Um, how many of you would prefer to have written out instructions that, that tell you turn by turn how to get to the location? And how many of you would prefer to have both the written and the visual? Okay, so for me, I like to see these things and then I'll take my highlighter and I'll actually mark on the map and I'll write it out myself. And in this way, I embed the information on where I need to go in my mind. So I am then using all three methods of gaining the information so that I actually can retain it. We're not actually going to the bar. <laughs> Just want to make that clear and I am not buying. Okay, so when writing material, readability is key. And most of us are used to writing for the professional and academic audiences. <coughs> we use jargon and complex sentence structures. When writing for the public, a handy tool that I use is the uh, Fry uh, Readability Graph. And on this, you can see that I've taken just part of what I've just read and placed it here. I've broken it out according to the syllables. And the way the graph works is it counts the number of syllables and sentences within 100 words. And you can see that even in this very simple sentence, which doesn't hold much jargon, we're off the chart. We're definitely at an academic professional level that this session would not be understandable to the general public. I try to aim at about a fifth grade level, fifth to seventh grade level, when presenting information to a general public. Basic pedagogical practices can improve communication. These include some that we've heard before. Relate the new information to a common base of knowledge. Model how the information is to be used. In an oral presentation especially, if you ask a question, provide the wait time that allows people to process the information in their mind before giving a response. Ask open-ended questions as opposed to those just that require a yes or a no. 
And then when selecting individuals to answer questions, alternate between looking at the front of the room to the back of the room and from male to female. And this brings people to the feeling that there is more con inclusion and not just worrying about the people in the front who keep raising their hands. As we have heard in the previous presentations, different cultural groups have different levels of comfort for communication with regards to context and directness. But there are other factors that enter into a decision on what to say, what to share, especially with someone from the outside. In the American Southwest, where I developed many of my outreach programs, archeology span was uh, on pre-contact American Indian sites the descendants of which are still living today. Their stories of origin and place in many cases are different than the scientific story. And when I ask people for information to include in the education programs and the outreach materials, I got a response that people really didn't want their stories there. They didn't want their information to be incorporated in and presented as part of the scientific view. In response to their concerns, I created a program that I call Parallel Perspectives. There's more to one story of the past. Archaeology presents a scientific version of the human existence, one that's based on hypothesis and data and interpretation. Cultures have traditional stories that interpret and maintain the past through oral histories, the stories, and their traditions. Parallel Perspectives is an educational program that encourages children to listen to the stories from both the scientific perspective and the traditional perspective, and then to put them together for themselves to create their own understanding of the past. Students initiate their own research and create their own interpretation. There is no right or wrong answer. It's simply an enlightening process that can help the students build a framework for understanding the past. Parallel Perspectives program provides a process for understanding that includes indigenous members, such as elders, archaeologists, anthropologists, teachers, and children. It provides a mechanism that allows the learner to mesh the science and tradition. In American Indian communities, many children receive one version of their heritage at home and quite different version of heritage at school. Parallel Perspectives uses field experiences and hands-on learning intermingled with the interactions from their elders in order to discover diverse topics related to archaeology and cultural history. Using Parallel Perspectives, teachers find exciting new ways to, to teach the state requirements in science, mathematics, history, and also to allow the students to connect to their personal heritage. At a community level, the incorporation of archaeology and traditional cultural knowledge has created opportunities for various audiences to relate to and gain a fuller picture of the past. The information on this slide was on a simple four-page handout that we used on site tours, and everybody was given the opportunity then to see next to each other, the stories, as opposed to it all being woven together. Parallel Perspectives program was initiated as one part of cultural resource management program when I worked at Statistical Research Incorporated. One project, Native American middle school students were introduced to archaeology through classroom activities and visits to an actual dig. Three field trips were scheduled for students with their parents as chaperones and cultural consultants of the Tahona Dam Nation. On the first, students learned about archaeological testing. During lunch, the elders shared the traditional stories of how the site would have been used and what the plants were. The second field trip took place during the mitigation phase of the project when the students got to watch the archaeologists excavate the floor of a pre-contact period of house, and they actually got to help uh, sift the dirt through the screen and identify the cultural items. The third field trip took the group to the um, office where the students were able to learn about macrobotanical analysis 
and wash artifacts in the laboratory, some of which they had seen in the field. As an outcome of the program, the students did a service learning project where they took what they learned about the traditional plants and the macrobotanical analysis, and they created a book with the information about the materials. They got seeds from a traditional source, grew starts of the plants, and all of those materials were then used on the public site tours that we did at the site that they visited. Projects do not need to be complex or long. One particularly easy activity that is to tie the past to the present through archaeology, experimental archaeology, traditional stories, and ethnography. And that would be making cordage or string. Cordage was used to tie things together all through time. We still use it today. And yet, except for dry caves or archaeological sites with the soil at just the right pH, cordage is rarely preserved. Making cordage and the discussions of how cordage can be used can lead to interesting discussions regarding the preservation of materials, sharing traditional stories or events about items that use string, like hunting or fishing, connect the discussions from archaeology to actual people. Archaeology education was first introduced to audiences at Hokkaido University's Center for Ainu and Indigenous Studies at a symposium in December 2007. Um, we did workshops that were geared to teachers, Ainu cultural leaders, and Ainu peoples themselves in 2008. And it was during that time that I taught about making cordage and showed Ainu objects and a length, lengthy discussion took place afterwards by everyone. After that, we took the event up to an actual hands-on day on the site in the Sheratoko Peninsula, where we taught the students in the archaeology program how to make the cordage, and then the students themselves worked with the children the instructions that had originally been written in English were translated into Japanese, laid out on the table with the material. And even though I don't speak Japanese more than the most uh, basic, polite phrases and greetings, I was able to communicate in English using hands-on and demonstration, and there was complete communication going back and forth. If there was a particular question, um, there were students there who were able to then help the children. A particularly exciting moment was when one of the teachers came up to the uh, uh, project. And when he came to visit the site in 2009, he was very interested in the hands-on because they don't do much hands-on education within the classroom. Um, he ended up taking all of the hands-on material back with him to his classroom so that he could teach the children what we did that day. The next year, he came out to the other site that we were working on, and he brought with him a textbook to show that between 2009 and 2010, information on Ainu culture was actually now included, whereas it had never been before. Archaeological education, and in particular parallel perspectives, has been and can be used not only to teach about archaeology, but to teach about traditional Western concepts of culture, science, math, and technology. For indigenous peoples, the result can be a personal clarification of their heritage and cultural identity. For non-indigenous peoples, the result can be a greater understanding and appreciation of other cultures. Using education theory, communication techniques, in conjunction with the correlation of traditional stories and archaeological information, this engages archaeologists, indigenous people, and community members in the conversation. Overall, the results are greater communication and cultural understanding. Understanding cultural communication and education theory has made me a more effective archaeologist as a result, there's been much more rewarding work on the site with descendant communities and with community members. 
Sometimes the act of just sitting and making cordage or beading or carving has drawn people into conversations that I never would have been able to have. They've provided an entry point for sharing in both directions that goes well beyond the academic exchange. Thank you.